So, let us look at a, an example here uh, where we are looking at the possibility of applying different thresholds to different intervals of coefficients. In the previous example, we looked at the case of applying a single threshold, the universal threshold and as I said, the, is the universal threshold only requires estimate of sigma and you can use any estimator of sigma. The standard estimate as I said is the uh, square 2 norm of the detailed coefficients. There exists many other estimators of sigma, All it all depends on how you look at it. For example, I can look at the median of the detailed coefficients and use a correction factor to that median. That correction factor is usually 0 0.6745. So, I can say sigma hat is median of the detailed coefficients divided by 0 0.6745. I have that in the lecture notes for you. You can look up that. Then there exists many other ways called uh, mini max way of estimating the threshold which gives you tables uh, for values of sigma depending on the signal, uh, the characteristics of the measurement and so on. Now, we look at this example where <coughs> I may have to apply two th different thresholds to two different intervals of the coefficients, right. And one such example here is given, it, it actually comes loaded with the MATLAB's wavelet toolbox. So, go to file, example analysis and choose here noisy signal and you can see interval uh, denoising and choose the last one here electrical consumption. Ignore uh, all the plots except the top one here. The top one contains the signal itself and you can see clearly that the noise levels are different as you move from this first half to the second half. In fact, the second half has much lesser noise in it, right. So, to be able to uh, see this, let us choose a one level decomposition so that I have uh, more of the signal shown. So, look at the signal here. Now, you can see clearly this is a one level decomposition due to Haar. It is always good to begin with a Haar wavelet decomposition because it gives you good time resolution characteristics one and secondly it does a good, it is a default difference filtering kind of uh, option. So, it gives you decent estimate of the noise levels and so on. So, if you look at this decomposition, the top is the signal, the middle plot is the approximation, reconstructed approximation and the bottom part is the reconstructed uh, details that are left out. So, if you sum up the blue and the green, you get the red here. You can clearly see that the, uh, if you even if you simply assume that the green one is a noisy component of the measurement, the noise levels are totally different beyond a certain point. In this case, applying a single threshold to the entire set of detail, uh, any set of coefficients at any scale is not the wise thing to do. So, we can choose uh, a different <coughs> wavelet also. Here, uh, I think the simlet wavelet is being used. So, we will leave the wavelet as is, but we will change the level of decomposition maybe to a four level decomposition and then ask for denoising. And here we shall, of course, to just to see the difference between the interval level decomposition, uh, sorry, thresholding, interval based thresholding and a single thresholding. First, we shall apply the single thresholding and this threshold again is indicated on the left with the blue dashed lines and we can ask for denoising using the soft thresholding approach. Here, I do not have any sharp features. So, I can still use a soft thresholding, it will produce a soft estimate. What you see as a color map plot here is the color map of the coefficients plot, okay, which is okay. I mean, it is basically again telling you, uh, in fact, these coefficients are only detailed coefficients. It is once again telling you that the there is more energy contained in the first half of the time period versus the second half of the time period which is darker. The darker color here corresponds to lower energy. So, now if I simply use the uh, <coughs> standard same uh, fixed threshold 
over the entire scale and denoise, then I get such a signal here, all right. So, this is the approximation, but if I use an interval based thresholding, then what do I do? So, what I do here is I say generate the intervals automatically. See, I can specify visually by looking at the coefficients visually, I can specify how many intervals uh, of noise va uh, variations are present in the data. Here I have two intervals. In the first half, the noise level is much higher than the second half, but I can ask it to generate automatically. So, when I say generate, it automatically figures out that there are two intervals in the data where the noise levels are differing and that is indicated by the red dashed line here. And now, I can say uh, use this Oops, sorry. Sorry about this mistake. So, let us choose here. Say two intervals and then you say apply. So, you update, yes, and now we update. And what it has done as you can see in the sliders here, in fact you can manually adjust the thresholds, it has actually chosen different thresholds also and for different intervals and now you can ask for denoising. This is the denoised version. So, you can look at the bottom plots here. The bottom plot here is showing you how the coefficients look like after the thresholding has been applied. Here I have applied an interval threshold on the top here. I can see the reconstructed signal in blue. It looks much better than the uh, one that I had obtained by applying a fixed threshold. Right. So, let us actually go back and um, I do not know. Uh, so, let us, so just go back as an exercise in the interest of time I am not going to do it. So, just go back to the case where we had applied a single threshold and compare. In fact, all of this can be exported. So, if you go to file and <coughs> here when you say save, you can save the denoised signal, you can save the coefficients, you can save the decomposition and so on. So, when you say save denoised signal, uh, it will ask you to save it in a file and so on. So, you can of course, do many other things, but hopefully you have seen the difference between the signal that I have obtained by applying interval thresholding versus the fixed thresholding. Okay. The, it is also useful to look at the residuals from your denoising. That is the final thing that I want to show you and that will give you an idea of whether you have performed a good signal estimation or not. So, what you see on the top here, how did I come to this plot here? The way I have come to this plot is by hitting the residuals button here and that brings up the residuals. It gives me a histogram. It also gives me what is known as the autocorrelation function. If the assumption normally what I assume is that the signal has white noise in it, a measurement has white noise in it, but the measurements can also have correlated noise. But suppose I have assumed white noise and I performed the estimation and I have made a mistake, then the residual analysis will reveal that such discrepancies. So, here what does the residual analysis as, uh, show me? It shows that these are the residuals at the top which is good because it is showing clearly that it has extracted the noise uh, qualitatively at least correctly. And on the bottom I have the histogram, the probability distribution plot indicating that it has more or less a Gaussian distribution and what you see at the bottom here below the, hist uh, the histogram plot distribution plot is the autocorrelation. If the signal is white, the autocorrelation should have a single spike at lag 0 and insignificant values at other lags and that is what it shows here. On the x axis you have lags, uh, hopefully you remember what is autocorrelation. 
on the right hand side I have power spectrum and if the residual has white noise characteristics then the power spectrum should be more or less flat. I should not see a significant trend. All of this is more or less satisfactorily uh, met here. So, I would like you to take an example where you have correlated noise and perform a signal uh, estimation exercise and look at the residuals and it will show you clearly that you have made a wrong assumption of white noise. Then what happens if it is correlated then you have to use different thresholds. The universal threshold that we apply by default with all the default options is good for white noise. For correlated data that is correlated noise you have to use different thresholding characteristics and so on. There is so much of literature on this that it is obviously impossible for me to go over it in, in such a short span, but hopefully the basic ideas have been conveyed and what I had promised to you is that I will give you a reference which discusses many of these different situations and that is a very nice survey of the different methods. Okay, so, play around with this GUI, there is so much to learn from this GUI and the plots are also uh, quite useful and you should play around with the different plots and so on. There are advanced versions that uh, advanced options that you can exercise to generate the plots that are useful to you in your application. So, I am going to close the GUI here and quickly take you <coughs> to the uh, final lecture on this uh, topic which is essentially summarizing what we discussed except for one point which we have not discussed which is how the wavelet implementations in uh, MATLAB's toolbox or in general handle the boundary effects. I am just going to talk to you briefly about those boundary effects for 5 to 7 minutes. So, uh, as I just said any wavelet analysis uh, DWT or CWT involves convolutions and convolutions always suffer from boundary effects. And how do you handle this boundary effects? Well, the standard solutions that exist in the filtering literature are used. Either you assume that the signal is periodic outside the interval. Why, why do these boundary effects even arise in the first case? Because remember, you are when you place the wavelet or the scaling function at the start of the signal or at the end of the signal, there is a portion of the scaling function or the wavelet that lies outside the observation interval. And that is why you end up with these boundary effects and we had also studied cone of influence for example, in CWT that is also an effect of the boundary effect. So, coming back to the solutions, there are many solutions. One is that you could periodize that is you can have periodic extension of the signal outside the interval or zero pad or do a symmetric extensions or smooth padding. These are the four different solutions. There is another solution which you can uh, also pursue you can read up the literature which are called wavelets on an interval. That is you use wavelets exactly that are defined only over the interval of the signals extension and that is fairly theoretical, but they are used uh, also in implementation. But largely we will only discuss these four possibilities very quickly. We know what periodic extensions and zero paddings do they introduce artificial discontinuities. And symmetric padding is much nicer or to the signal at the boundaries and then there is a smooth padding which is essentially an extra, uh, extrapolation of the signal at the boundaries. So, let us look at the what the zero padded extension uh, how the signal is extended using the zero padding. So, the red the one that is uh, shown in the uh, red is the extended version and that one that is shown in the blue is original. You do not see the blue signal because over the interval of observation that is from 0 to uh, 28 you have the signal 27 and then what I am doing is I am performing an extension of the signal outside that interval because of the filter length. How much do you have to extend the signal outside the length? Uh, outside the observation interval depends on the length of the filter. If I am using a Daubishi 2 filter which has 4 filter coefficients, then I will need extensions to the left of how many I will need 2 to the left and 2 to the right and so on. 
So, here I am assuming that I need only one extension to the left and right, this is only for illustration purposes. If you were to do a 0 padding, this is how it would uh, look like and if you were to do a symmetric extension as you can see to the left and right I have symmetric extensions. Where is left? To the left of 0 and right is to the left of your uh, 27. So, you have I have done here 2 point symmetric extension and the, uh, the this is known as the half point extension. There is something called a half point extension and a whole point extension. The difference is very clear. In a half point extension, let us say I need to generate x at minus 1 what I would do is I would set that to x 0 and then x of minus 2 to x of 1 and so on. This is half point extension. Why is it called half point extension? Because the point of symmetry is between minus 1 and 0. See the point is where is the point, uh, where do you think the symmetry is? The signal begins here, right. Let us say the uh, signal begins here at 0, right. And if you look at the signal that I have here uh, at the next point I have here. So, I need values at minus 1 and minus 2. Where is the point of symmetry if I am doing a symmetric extension? If I am adopting this extension here, what I am going to do is at minus 1 I am going to set the value to x0. By doing so, what I am doing is I am assuming that the point of symmetry is here. This is a symmetry line. That is why it is called a half point extension, the symmetry is at uh, minus half. In a whole point extension as I will show you, what we do is we set, we set x minus 1 to be 1 and x minus x at minus 2 to be 2, where I assume the symmetry point is at 0, right. So, in a whole point in ext uh, symmetric extension x minus 1 would be simply this value here, okay. That is uh, so, which uh, symmetry, ex, uh, which extension should I use? If I am using even filters like Daubishi 2 and so on, they are all even filters in the sense even number of coefficients, then it is recommended that we use half point extension and for odd length filter coefficients, the whole point extension is recommended. This is nicely discussed in the book by Gilbert Strang and uh, Guyen. It is known as Wavelets and Filter Banks. It is a very celebrated book. So, I just showed you in the previous slide half point extension. Now, the whole point extension on both sides as I said look at it at the ends the repeated values that is if you look at the point 0 then you have minus 1 right. At minus 1 what is the value? It is a value at 1 whereas, let me take you back to the half point extension this is 0 padding. Look at the half point extension at minus 1 the value is at 0 itself that is what is the half point extension, okay. So, hopefully you understood and there is no need that you have to extend on both sides also depends on what you are doing. You can extend uh, on one side alone. Periodic extension of course, is based on the periodicity assumption. You simply assume the signal to be periodic. Now, both periodic assumption and the 0 padding uh, extension introduce artificial discontinuities and they can bring about a lot of spurious artifacts. It does not mean other extensions do not, but they are much nicer uh, at the signal. So, symmetric extension is a very good option and if you are using as I said even filter coefficients, the half point extension is what is uh, used. In fact, if you go to MATLAB and you want to know what extension MATLAB uses, then simply go to MATLAB and type DWT mode. So, it uses a symmetric half point extension. Why does it use this? Because most of the filters that we are using are even coefficient, uh, even length uh, filters, even coefficient filters and therefore, uh, you can use this. But you can choose for example, to uh, so if you look at help DWT mode, it will tell you what are all the extensions that are possible. <coughs> you see it is the symmetric and then you can whole point symmetry or you can use an asymmetric uh, extension, anti-symmetric extension 
half point and you can use an anti-symmetric. You understand what is anti-symmetric I suppose, right? I mean it is actually x minus 1 would be uh, not x1 but uh, in an anti-symmetric manner minus x1 and then you have 0 padding option and then you have the periodic uh, padding, smooth padding and so on. So, uh, DWT mode per sets the D DWT mode in a periodic mode and so on, all right. So, there are different options and it is given here the default mode is loaded from the file DWT mode f. You can go and change if you want. So, that your DWT mode is always uh, that is extension mode is always to the one that you desire. But it is better to uh, re retain the symmetric half point extension as long as you are using the even length uh, even coefficient filters. So, let us quickly conclude this presentation. So, this is a symmetric and this is a periodic extension and there are other extensions as I said finally, smooth extensions of 0th that is constant what you assume is the signal is constant outside the interval that is called a smooth extension of 0th order. The 0th uh, signal was constant before and after to the values at x 0 and at x n minus 1. First order would use interpolation that is it uses x 0 and x 1 to calculate a slope and extend it outside and at the other end it would use x n minus 1 and x n minus 2 to look at. So, now which is good which is bad well uh, let us talk about that very quickly. The symmetric extension produces discontinuities in the first derivative. Therefore, if you are uh, dealing with signals uh, itself and you are not worried about the derivative symmetric extensions are very good. Despite introducing discontinuities in the first derivatives at the edges, it still works well for images because in images mostly I am worried about edge detection or equivalent of discontinuity detection in signals. Because it introduces discontinuities in the first derivatives, it should work well even for pure edge detection. Zero padding as we have mentioned, it produces artificial discontinuities. You should not do it as much as possible, should not do not uh, resort to zero padding at all. Smooth padding works well for smooth signals. If the signal is smooth, definitely an interpolation would be really nice and the level of smoothing, the order of smoothing, whether you are going to use a first order, second order and so on depends on the signal. If you know a priori what the signal is before. Once again, periodic padding introduces discontinuities. Now, regardless of the extension, the perfect reconstruction is always guaranteed. In fact, what you should try is uh, in, in the example analysis that I have done, I have taken a signal of length which is power of 2, but what you should do is take a signal of arbitrary length and see what extension the signal performs. I will leave it as a simple exercise for you and then see if you are able to recover the signal despite the extension that is being applied. Okay. And all uh, this is what is important if you want the norm preservation and the orthogonality to be preserved, the periodic extension is the only one that guarantees the norm preservation. What is this norm preservation? Earlier we said that the sum square signal is the sum square of the approximation and the detail coefficients. That is theoretically guaranteed only when periodic extensions are used, all right. But it did work for the uh, signal that we used although the default mode is symmetric half point uh, extension. It worked, but uh, th that is probably a case specific uh, thing and probably because we are using a length which is power of 2, but strictly speaking the norms and the orthogonality are preserved only if you use periodic extensions. So, finally, let me give you the reference for the signal estimation. Here this is the reference that, uh, that, uh, that is the reference to the paper that discusses different thresholding methods and you can see a, a big table here which has 12 entries in it. The name derives from the uh, kind of method you are using for the thresholding and how you are applying the uh, thresholding. So, universal thresholding is a default one and this third column tells you 
how the thresholding is being applied, what universal means in their paper. This is not necessarily the nomenclature that is used in the wavelet literature, but in that paper what universal means is a universal method uh, thresholding is used to calculate the threshold and it is applied globally which means to all scales and how is it applied in a hard thresholding manner. So, if I pick for example, mini max soft which is a third entry, then a mini max method which, uh, which has a table of thresholds for different situations that is how the threshold is computed again applied globally, but a soft thresholding is uh, used and so on. So, you can understand what each of this is, we have not discussed all the different thresholding methods such as uh, MDL or the multi sure and so on, but if you read this paper it will be very clear to you what each of this method is doing to estimate the threshold and also there is something called a firm thresholding and a garrot thresholding. They are slightly advanced versions of the hard and soft thresholding. Okay. The uh, garrot thresholding performs an interval thresholding that is in the hard and soft thresholding what we are doing is we are partitioning the coefficients into two spaces one which are below the threshold other which is above the threshold. In garrot thresholding the partitioning is done into three spaces one which is below a threshold lambda 1 other which is in between uh, two thresholds lambda 1 and lambda 2 and the third one which is above the threshold lambda 2. So, again that is a more advanced one and more sophisticated, but more sophisticated means also more headache you will have to specify two thresholds then it becomes sensitive to the choice of two thresholds and so on. So, uh, the basic idea has been laid out the rest of all the rest of uh, the methods that you see here or all the methods that you see in the literature are just flavors of those uh, methods. Finally, I just want to conclude with the uh, with this <coughs> brief mention of discontinuity detection. There is an example here in the lecture notes on uh, discontinuity detection, which I would like you to go through very quickly. If you uh, look at the <coughs> example, so here is a sine wave, you do not know where the discontinuity is, the signal is shown on the top. I perform a Haar filtering and show you here the approximation and detail uh, coefficients. You can see in D 1 the discontinuity is nicely picked up close to uh, 150 here right. And then as I in choose a wavelet with higher vanishing moments, the Haar wavelet has one vanishing moment. If I choose D B 2 then its ability to clearly detect the discontinuity falls down because now the spike that I see close to 150 is actually uh, much smaller in magnitude than what you see with the Haar wavelet. So, it is very distinct and pronounced with the Haar wavelet. Whereas, with d b 2 it is not as pronounced and as I increase the vanishing moments the spike goes down I am fixing the level as is. Okay. So, what this shows is the ability of the wavelet to detect a discontinuity in the signal falls down as the number of vanishing moments increases. On the other hand, there is a nice example in the wavelet GUI which shows you how the uh, discontinuity is detected better by a wavelet with larger vanishing moments than the Haar wavelet because the discontinuity is not in the signal, but in the der second derivative. And let me just quickly uh, tell you here what that is, I am sorry I should have shown you earlier, but let me bring up the wavelet one day. And if you go under the examples, um, under the basic signals, there is something called a second derivative breakdown. Okay. So, one with the uh, second derivative breakdown So, you can see here this is the second derivative breakdown if you look at the signal the signal does not have any discontinuity the first derivative is also continuous, but the second derivative is discontinuous for that you should take the second derivative of the signal just take the second difference and you plot you will see the discontinuity what is shown here is the approximation and the details not the coefficients obtained with db4 a two level decomposition obtained with db4 
and you can see the, disc the discontinuity in fact we know from construction. This uh, book, uh, this example is also discussed nicely in the book by uh, Missiti and Mayer and Oppenheim. So, that is the book that we have been referring to. You can, uh, this is also given in the references in the MATLAB documentation. The discontinuity is in fact at this location in the de second derivative. Now, if I use a Haar wavelet, what do I get? Right, the same level decomposition. What do I see? Now, this is totally different. Why does this happen? Well, this happens because <coughs> the of the number of vanishing moments. Haar wavelet has one vanishing moment. What does it mean? It can approximate uh, polynomials of 0th order very well. Now, what is happening here is the discontinuity is in the second derivative and the approximation order uh, here that is uh, the error that Haar wavelet makes in approximating the polynomial is of a very high order and therefore, you see this oscillating behavior. It is the full details of why this oscillating behavior around the discontinuity is given nicely in the book that I have just referred to. So, go back and refer to that uh, book, uh, it is nicely given there. Whereas, with if you increase the vanishing moments, your ability to detect the discontinuity unambiguously becomes very nice. In fact, if you lower the vanishing moments, you can once again see some the oscillating behavior. You can prove this theoretically that as the number of vanishing moments decreases and as the de and as the discontinuity appears in higher and higher derivatives for the signal, you will see an oscillating behavior for the uh, details uh, or the for the high frequency components around the discontinuity. I am not going to spend time on that, but just to give you a feel of what the number of vanishing moments of a wavelet can do to your ability uh, to detect discontinuities in the signals derivatives. So, hopefully these two examples have thrown good light on this fact. With this we bring a closure to the topic of DWT. Uh, the attempt has been to give you the basics of DWT which will help you march along and learn other versions of DWT such as wavelet packet transform, maximal overlap DWT. I have already explained what is maximal overlap DWT. It is only it only involves discretizing the scales at dyadic levels, but no discretization of the translation. And the wavelet packet transform differs from DWT in the sense that it also decomposes the detail coefficients at each scale and that throws open throws doors to a variety of uh, applications which the DWT cannot even handle and it is beyond the scope of the course to discuss the wavelet packet transform. So, the effort has been to give you as much as possible of, uh, strong fundamentals on DWT, show you how things are implemented in MATLAB. Uh, of course, that is a platform in which we have been showing things to you. What are the practical aspects and discuss the primary applications of DWT which is in signal compression, signal estimation and discontinuity detection. So, hopefully you enjoyed the uh, theory of DWT uh, in this uh, unit 8 and of course, put together with the unit 7 that makes the entire uh, package for you for wavelet transforms. Uh, and if you have any questions as usual, please feel free to write to us. Good luck and uh, see you in the closing lecture.